Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Poor Man's Chemist. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? In this video, we will be doing a general overview of chromatography. In particular, we will be discussing the basics of how this process works, and we will be taking a look at some of the more popular chromatographic methods used in analytical chemistry, namely gas and liquid chromatography, or GC and LC. Although it can get a little technical, this isn't rocket science by any means, and I've done my best to make this understandable to a general chemistry enthusiast audience. I've not done a deep dive into plate theory or anything more advanced here, although I can in a future video if you guys really want me to. Before we get started, if you are enjoying this educational content, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and maybe throw a few bucks my way at one of the links in the description. Now, on to the good shit. The basic idea behind chromatography is very easy to understand. I've taken this diagram of column chromatography from Wikipedia to illustrate the general idea of how this works. Different compounds that are being moved through a porous solid substance by some mobile substance like a liquid or gas will move through that solid substance at different rates because different substances will have different levels of affinity for the solid that they are moving through. Some compounds will barely interact with the solid at all, and so will move through it relatively quickly, whereas compounds that interact with the solid a lot will move much more slowly. The net result is that a mixture of compounds can be reliably separated into its individual components simply by setting up a system where a gas or liquid pushes these compounds through a porous solid substance under carefully controlled conditions. So carefully controlled temperature, pressure, pH, flow rates of the mobile substance, etc. Furthermore, if all the conditions are carefully controlled, we can even identify a compound based on how long it takes for the gas or liquid to push it through the solid. We can do this because the rate at which a particular compound can be moved by a particular mobile substance through a particular solid substance is always the same if the, all of the exact same conditions are used. By using reference compounds whose identities are known for certain, we can experimentally determine these travel times for many thousands of different chemical compounds. And since this is a physical process, the compounds should be chemically unchanged during the separation. Now that you have a basic idea of how this works, it's time to learn some chromatography jargon so that we can all sound like we're highly educated. The compounds to be separated are known as the solutes, or analytes, and the mixture of them is generally called the sample. The gas or liquid that moves these solutes through the porous solid is known as the mobile phase, or eluent, which sounds much cooler. The solid is creatively called the stationary phase, since it doesn't move during the chromatographic process. For thin layer chromatography, the stationary phase is fixed to a glass or metal plate, and for gas and liquid chromatography, the stationary phase is packed into a metal tube that is called a column. Since this video is about LC and GC, everything we will be talking about involves the use of columns. The time it takes for an analyte to travel completely through the column is known as its retention time. The time it takes for a compound which doesn't interact with the stationary phase at all to pass through the column is called the dead time. This is basically the time it takes the mobile phase itself to pass through the stationary phase, since we want the mobile and stationary phases to have a minimal interaction between each other. Once an analyte elutes from the column, it flows directly into a detector, which can pick up when the analytes come off the column. If the detector is a mass spec, it will not only give us the retention time of the analyte, but it will also give us its molecular weight. If the retention time of the analyte from the unknown sample matches the retention time of a reference sample and the molecular weight is correct, then we can be pretty confident about the identity of the compound. 
Now it is possible for two different compounds to have the same retention time, but we can vary the parameters of the chromatography to separate out compounds that would otherwise overlap. However, chromatography can tell us even more about our analyte than just its identity. It can also tell us the concentration of the analyte in a sample. What you are looking at now is an example of a chromatogram. The peaks on the chromatogram correspond to the response from the detector as the analytes elute from the column and pass into the detector. Since the analyte will spread out some as it moves through the column, which is a process called longitudinal diffusion, which creates band broadening, the detector should record a signal that rises and falls smoothly, giving a nice symmetrical Gaussian peak. The area under the peak corresponds to the concentration of the analyte in the sample. So integrating the peak along the baseline gives us that piece of information to go with the analyte's identity. Now the baseline is the default signal that is received from the detector at all times. Even though it looks like a flat line, if you zoom into it a lot, you will see that the baseline is actually composed of small signal variations which produce a jagged line. The peak from an analyte must be very large compared to this baseline noise. In other words, it must have a high signal to noise ratio in order for the peak to be meaningful. It is absolutely not acceptable to zoom into the baseline at the retention time of your expected analyte, integrate whatever happens to be there, and say that the analyte was present. No, it really wasn't. You were just integrating noise. This is a cardinal sin in chromatography. Another unforgivable heresy is when chemists tweak the integration so that it's sloped and not baseline to baseline. In other words, cooking the concentration data. It is also unacceptable to integrate a peak if it overlaps with another peak, since there is no way to tell where one stops and another starts. Yet another very important thing to consider is that the concentration of the analyte must fall within two specific ranges called the limit of detection and the limits of quantization. I always have a hard time saying that word. I hate that word. We're just going to call these the LOD and the LOQs. The limit of detection is essentially what it sounds like. It is the limit established by experimentation that the instrument can reliably detect a particular analyte. If we want to get technical about it, we can use Google's succinct definition, which is the lowest concentration of an analyte in a sample that can be consistently detected within a stated probability, typically at 95% certainty. Even if a small peak appears to be present on the baseline when you zoom into it in the, to the nth degree, if the concentration obtained by integration along the baseline is below the limit of detection, then you cannot say that you have reliably detected the compound. It could be some kind of residual analyte from a previous run or some other kind of column or instrument issue. The LOQ is the range of concentration of analytes that elicit a linear response from the detector. If you run a series of chromatograms for a single analyte, starting with a blank sample and then progressing in concentration, what you will find is that there is a range of concentrations in which the re response from the detector is so close to a straight line that the slight variations from linearity are negligible. Above this range, the response from the detector becomes exponential. We can only obtain reliable concentration data for that range of concentrations from which the response from the detector is linear. If the sample is so concentrated that it's outside of that range, it must be diluted and run again, more than once if need be, until a reliable concentration can be established. It is also possible for an analyte to be so dilute that its concentration cannot be reliably calculated using that particular chromatographic and detection system as established by experiment. This usually happens because the system simply isn't sensitive enough to reliably quantify a sample at this concentration, although there can be other interfering factors. This results in LOQs typically having a lower and upper range. 
Now, if the peaks are not Gaussian, then the peak shape can be used to tell us what kind of problems we are having with our analysis. Fronting can be caused by overload. The concentration of the analyte is too high. This is the most common cause of fronting. Coalution of two different compounds can also cause fronting or column degradation just because it's been used over time, you know, just regular use. Um, it's degraded to the point that it needs to be replaced. This is what I call column death. That is not a technical term, but it very succinctly, you know, sums up what the deal is. Tailing can be caused by secondary interactions between analytes in the stationary phase. For example, residual acidic groups on the stationary phase, which really shouldn't be there and aren't uniformly distributed, could interact with alkaline functional groups on an analyte like amines. So that can cause tailing. Tailing can also be caused by column voids, partial blockage of the inlet to the column, resulting in asymmetrical loading of the column, and mass overloading of the column. In other words, the entire sample is too concentrated and needs to be diluted. Bad peak resolution, where peaks overlap, can be caused by mobile phase flow rate problems, since the amount of band broadening observed is highly dependent on the flow rate of the mobile phase. Another manifestation of bad peak resolution occurs when peaks have shoulders, which represent the coalition of two different compounds. You cannot just integrate until the shoulder and say that you've established a minimum concentration of the analyte. You have no idea where one peak started and the other stopped. It cannot be quantified. It is worth noting that in general, samples of pure chemicals tend not to kill columns as quickly as samples with a biological origin do. The reason is that biological samples are a witch's brew of all manners of different compounds, and even if a chromatographic method has been validated for the analysis of a particular set of analytes, there are other compounds that are invariably present in the mix. These can clog up the stationary phase in a column, causing everything from bad chromatograms to complete flow blockage. In gas chromatography, this can be handled by clipping off a short section of the beginning of the column where junk will tend to be trapped. We will talk more about GC columns later in the video, and I'll explain why you can just cut pieces off of them. But for now, just accept that this is an easy thing to do. Clipping the column does change the retention time slightly. However, since all chromatographic analyses must always include a set of calibrators and controls, which are created using pure analytical grade reagents, we can identify the new retention times for the analyte using those. And then we just tell the chromatography software, hey, instead of this old retention time, look for this peak at this new retention time. And then it goes through and integrates it. And then the poor tech has to go through and manually check the integration on every single freaking one of them. Tons of fun. The way biojizz is handled in liquid chromatography is by the use of guard columns. A guard column is a small, sacrificial piece of column that the sample passes through first before going into the actual column. The guard column collects all the shit, and when it's gunked up, it's simply discarded and replaced, and thus the much more expensive column is protected from premature column death. All right. Now that we have a basic idea of how chromatography works, let's take a look at a couple specific applications of these principles, starting with gas chromatography. Many people have heard of this since it's what often confirms that the substance in their possession or in their system was something that was very naughty indeed. The way gas chromatography works is that a sample is prepped following an established procedure which results in a standardized liquid solution of the sample that can be tested. GC analyses are always conducted at high temperatures, like 2 to 300-ish C, somewhere in there if memory serves. So, the compound, so if the compound being tested for isn't amenable to GC analysis because it will decompose rather than vaporize, it can be converted to a derivative that is suitable for GC analysis during the sample prep. This is called derivatization, where a derivative of an analyte is prepared and analyzed. This is a very, very common procedure in both GC and LC.
In a typical GC instrument, the blank calibrators, controls, and unknown samples to be analyzed are loaded into a carousel, which is a little wheel with little slots in it to hold vials. The run is programmed into the chromatography software being used on a desktop computer connected to the instrument, and the instrument is started. The instrument will dry sample into a syringe and then rapidly inject several microliters of the sample into the body of the instrument. The sample is injected into a small oven through which the dried and I believe preheated mobile phase gas is flowing. The sample is vaporized very rapidly and the vapors are swept up in the mobile phase gas and enter the column. A GC column looks like a very long coil of wire that is hung up on a rack inside of an oven which maintains the co column at a constant high temperature of a few hundred C. The reason the column is so long is rather technical and has to do with a thing called the number of theoretical plates, which we won't get into here. But essentially, the longer the column, the better the separation of the analytes will be. Now, obviously, longer isn't always better because you want the run to finish today and we don't want excessive band broadening. We want a Goldilocks length, but that Goldilocks length is still pretty long. Because the column is so long and thin, it has to be handled gently as it is very easy to cut or break or crimp the thing. We can use the ease with which the column can be cut to trim the column if the beginning of it becomes gunked up with sample jizz, as was mentioned earlier. Inside the GC column, the stationary phase typically consists of some kind of silicone-based oil that is covalently bound to some kind of matrix. I've never understood what dark engineering rights they use to get this stuff in such a long, thin tube, but I've always assumed they start with a thicker, shorter pack tube and then somehow roll or extrude the thing. Although how the stationary fast wouldn't become a solid mass during this process is beyond me. It's probably best not to ponder too deeply the forbidden sorceries of the Manufactorum tech priests. Regardless, that's what the stationary phase is usually composed of in these columns. The vaporized analytes, as well as the solvent they were dissolved in, are pushed through the column by the gas, and as they travel, those analytes which are retained longer in the stationary phase will have a longer retention time and will move through the column slowly while as those that are retained less will travel through the column faster. The degree of retention is usually based on polarity interactions. A hydrophobic stationary phase will retain more hydrophobic analytes longer, and more hydrophilic analytes will re be retained for a shorter period of time. If two analytes were to have essentially the same degree of interaction with the stationary phase, then the smaller molecule will travel through the stationary phase faster since it will tend to diffuse into and out of the stationary phase more easily. Once the analytes make it all the way through the column, they are directly channeled into a detector. These days, this is usually a mass spec, although mass specs are crazy expensive, and I've seen labs that are still using flame ionization detectors, or FIDs. These are cheaper, but mass specs are far better. And how much does a GCMS unit cost? GC and LC are, are like cars. There often isn't like a set dollar amount, or it's kind of hard to find set prices for these things. Agilent would never be so crass as to put easy-to-find prices for their products like we peasants do, but Waters was more obliging. If the mass spec is built into the GC unit, the unit's going to run somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000. Standalone, state-of-the-art mass specs can run over $100,000 all on their own. Basically, you need to own a business, be independently wealthy, or win the lottery to own one of these things. And even if you do own it, you've got to pay for the maintenance on it, and that ain't cheap either. Anyway, liquid chromatography uses a mixture of liquids instead of a gas as its mobile phase. And rather than being long coils of wire, LC columns are usually short, stout metal columns that usually range from a few inches to about a foot long for most run-of-the-mill LC instruments. Unlike a GC column, the only way you're cutting an LC column is if you use a hacksaw and your professor, lab manager, or instrument specialist may well have you flogged in the parking lot if you attempt it. Like everything else about these instruments, LC columns aren't cheap.
Now with LCs, the mobile phases are more complicated than you get with GC, which is a gas whose composition doesn't change. It is of course possible to do an LC run where the composition of the mobile phase doesn't change throughout the run, and these are called isocratic runs. However, you often find yourself analyzing samples which have mixes of analytes with wildly different retention times. Some will pass through the columns so slowly that the amount of band broadening makes the peak useless. A trick you can do to analyze run li runs like this is to start out with a more hydrophilic mix of solvents, say 90% of a buffered salt solution versus 10% of a methanol acetyl nitrile mix, for example. And over the course of the run, slowly change the concentration of the mobile phase until it's 10% hydrophilic and 90% hydrophobic at the end. These are called gradient runs. The variation of the mobile phase isn't done manually, it's all programmed into the computer and then the instrument does all the work. Now you may have noticed that I said a buffered aqueous salt solution. This is because LC is very sensitive to changes in pH, and so a buffered aqueous solution is employed to stabilize the pH at a set level. It is also sensitive to changes in temperature. So just as with GCs, the column for LCs is usually kept in a heated chamber on the instrument, although the temperatures involved here are much lower. Think like 30 to 40 C, that kind of thing. The compositions of stationary phases in LC can vary widely, but one common one is a porous solid made of a matrix on which is bonded long carbon chains. Um, C18 is a popular one. Once again, by employing arcane engineering lore, they managed to pack this stuff into the column in such a way that, although it's technically porous and feels and looks like a continuous solid, Remember, guard columns are composed of the same stationary phase that is used in the actual column and being designed to be cheap as possible. They're literally just the stationary phase packed into a plastic tube. So I've been able to see and touch LC stationary phase material many times, unlike with GC stationary phases. I've never even seen those. So yeah. LC stationary phases don't look or feel porous at all, and it takes a tremendous amount of pressure to push the mobile phase through the column. Typical pressures can range from thousands of PSI for HPLCs or high pressure liquid chromatography, so think like, like three to 5,000-ish 5, 5, PSI, to over 10,000 PSI for UPLCs, ultra high pressure liquid chromatography. Max pressure for UPLC systems is only a little bit less than the water pressure at the bottom of Ch Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. Like seriously, max pressure for UPLC is about 15,000 PSI, and the pressure at the bottom of Challenger Deep is 15.75 thousand PSI. <laughs> so it's very high pressure. But LC lines, columns, and guard column holders are all made of strong steel, and the pressures are applied across such a small area that there's no danger associated with using these systems. In fact, one trick to verify the flow rate is simply to unscrew the line from the column and let the mobile phase drip into a graduated cylinder while timing it. Although if you wanted to be more accurate, you'd use a tiny volumetric flask, right? It doesn't shoot out a jet of water that can lance through flesh and open vital arteries, making techs run around the lab screaming as they bleed out all over the place. That would be pretty metal, but also pretty impossible. Just as with GC, mass spec is going to be one of the best detection systems to use with LC. Less expensive options include fluorescence detectors and photodiode array detectors, among others. And I think that this is a good place to stop. To the 10% of the audience who actually made it to the end, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and donate to support wonderful educational content like this. And until the next one, you guys, I will see you later.